I'm Chip Rogers, and welcome to the AHOA Educational Experience. This week, joining me, my special guest, Fred Schwartz, president of the Asian American Hotel Owners Association. And next to him is Nitin Shaw with the Imperial Investments. And finally, Anil Patel with the North Star Hotel Group. Gentlemen, thank you, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, in the last two years, Americans have been uh, hearing all these acronyms as they deal with banking. And today we're going to talk about banking a little bit because we're going to try to bring people up to speed as to what's actually happening out there and, and what perhaps can be done to make things better. Uh, this one four-letter word that, that five years ago no one really knew what it meant. I want you to explain it. FDIC. What is that, Nitin, so people at home understand what we're dealing with? So FDIC was created back in 1930s when a lot of banks failed because of the Great Recession. Uh, there was a line in the banks to really withdraw the money because they thought their money would be lost. So the government came up with an idea that if we provide an insurance to people that if, uh, up to $100,000 of your money is insured in the institution even if the institution fails, for that they started charging the bank some premium. And with that premium they were running the entire fund to insure the people's deposits. Great idea, great concept, is valid as uh, ever today. Uh, uh, and FDIC remains a very vital part of banking institution. You and I generally don't want to put money if it's not insured in the bank. So FDIC is really there for a purpose and it's for a good purpose. And, and for a while there, the, the number was increased from 100 to 200, 250,000, I believe? It is still there. Right. It's 250,000 at still end of the 2012. And there is a, uh, I think Dodd-Frank makes it, trying to make it permanent. So you have the FDIC, which insures these deposits, but really has now engaged in, uh, in, in managing what occurs when one bank goes out of business or one bank is what we would call a failed bank is purchased by another bank. And now the FDIC really has their nose into everything that goes on from that point. So Anil, tell us uh, your experience with that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt now with banks that have been purchased by other banks and how the FDIC integrates itself into that relationship. Yeah. I can uh, chip one of the things uh, which we didn't talk about. I used to be a bank examiner. When I graduated out of college, I was a regulator and you go and audit the banks. Back then we had FSLIC also, mm -hmm. which was the Federal, uh, Saving Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation and FDIC of course is Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And uh, so in, in the regulatory uh, broad powers, they have the ability to literally tell bankers what an asset is worth, what, 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 you know, what kind of a losses that the asset is going to incur, and force the bank to put up reserves. And through the, the big uh, bureaucracy, uh, you, know, there are, you see banks shutting down all the time. You see banks forced to sell loans. They, uh, we just had an example in New Jersey where a bank was re, re, uh, uh, recapitalizing and cleaning up their balance sheet, they turned around and sold about $400 million in loans out in the public market. And you know, the hedge funds and the opportunistic funds went and bought these loans. And now they're beating up the borrowers, the ones that can't fight for themselves. So besides being just like, you know, when we hear a car insurance company, oh, they're great. <laughs> you have a car accident, they cover you, you, you let the deductible go, and your car is fixed. In the case of FDIC, it's, it's nowhere near the way the car insurance companies work because they're, in addition to insuring the deposits of the depositors, they're in the, in the business of regulating how a bank runs, how to call it, if, is it safe, is it sound? You know, they have a, a rating, I don't know if they still use ca camel rating or macro rating. Back, back in my days, it was macro camel rating, now. where they evaluate management, they evaluate operations, they evaluate capital, liquidity and asset quality and to do all of that it, it's it's a you know it's a task that I don't think some of the people in Wall Street and hedge funds know how to do here you have regulators doing it and some of it becomes subjective some of it becomes you know opinion of value I mean today if we put three appraisers in one room and said what's Nitin's hotel worth in Atlanta they're gonna come up with three different values I'm not saying they're wrong I'm not saying they're right they're all in the ballpark you know. so so FDIC, in addition to insuring it, they've, they've become a regulator, and I think it's the, the regulatory side and the way they're regulating and the way they're solving their problems. Easiest way for FDIC to solve its problem is if a bank is weak, you know, let it merge with a stronger bank, and therefore they don't incur a bigger loss. 
But in the meantime, when they're doing that, they're giving away freebies to the institution that's acquiring the failed bank, where that institution doesn't have the incentive to help the borrower or to help the asset recover, because they're simply told that if you got a $4 million loan, when you have a loss of $3 million, show us proof that you lost $3 million and we'll cut your check for three. So in that instance, rather than selling the property at the highest and best value, or if it needs a couple hundred thousand in renovation to recover $3 million rather than $1 million, they're not going to do that. Because what's the difference? The federal government's going to cut a check for it, and they're going to look for the fastest way to liquidate that asset. And the fastest way to liquidate any asset is to sell it far below market value far below its potential two years from now. And, and before, I, I, I do want to get into the loss sharing agreements because that is really impacting a lot of hotel owners. But Fred, you're sitting at, at the office in Atlanta and uh, you know maybe in 2006, 2007, you're not getting many calls about banking issues, but now it's almost a daily basis. Sure, yeah, our, our members are hurting. So the small business community is hurting. Access to capital is, is a big issue. Uh, members call, they may have, uh, uh, refinanced in 2007, uh, pulled out money, bought another hotel, leveraged uh, uh, at that point appropriately, and now with the devaluation of the of the asset, if it's gone down 30, 40 percent, the banks could be coming and wanting uh, uh, more money into the deal, and it's it's unfortunate. And we strive to get in the middle with the banks and say, look, you know, work with the person. The occupancies and average rates are increasing. Uh, this is a cycle. There's been 45 cycles since the founding of our country in 1776. Just work with them. Don't uh, mock to market it, mock, it, mock to reality, so to speak. Um, and just, you know, and, and the foreclosure is a big issue. And I know we're going to get into that in a little bit, but 85% of the bank acquisitions now uh, have a, uh, have a uh, law share component. To it. So it makes it very difficult for our members to uh, have a workout plan because it's in the bank's interest to foreclose because they get 80 percent of the loss. Of the loan, loss. And, and we've only got a minute before we've got to go to break, and, and I want to talk more about loss sharing after the break, but just from a, a textbook standpoint, explain what a loss sharing agreement is. What a loss share agreement is is when a bank is failing by charter, FDIC is suppo supposed to be the receiver of the bank. And when banks, if FDIC gets involved in owning that particular bank because they ran out of the capital or they have a liquidity problem, FDIC has to do with something with the asset of that bank, the loans, the deposit, and whatnot. The deposit, they can easily sell it off. The loans, they can retail sell it by liquidating each asset. But what they found out was it's easier to give somebody else a portion of their loss to allow them to purchase this failing bank, otherwise anybody will not purchase. Why would I purchase a failing bank if I had no, I, I would lose all the money that they would lose. So government came up with, the FDIC came up with an idea saying that we don't have to do all this hard work and retail sell every loan. Why don't you have an acquiring bank tell us when they liquidate all this through our next four or five year period, what would be their loss and we'll write an 80% check. Problem is not that. Fundamentally, that's a sound idea. It's what's inside the loss share agreement which allows the acquiring bank to do what to a small business owner like a hotel owner is what the problem is. And we're going to talk about that exact problem in the, in the second half come up, coming up after the break. So stay with us. You're watching the AHOA Educational Experience. And welcome back to the AHOA Educational Experience. I'm Chip Rogers, and with me this week is Fred Schwartz, president of AHOA and Nitin Shaw from Imperial Investments, and also Anil Patel with North Star Hotels Group. And, and Anil, we talked about in the last uh, part of the show about FDIC loss sharing agreements where the FDIC essentially encourages a healthy bank to purchase a failing bank and then give them some sort of guarantee on the losses they incur from that failing bank. That sounds, as Nitin pointed out, like a good idea, an easy way to handle this. But in reality, it's not necessarily helping all of the hotels who have loans because uh, the new bank operates with a different perspective in mind than the old bank. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Well, I think it's two share. One is the, the hotel operator. Let's take an example. If you have a $4 million loan on a $6 million hotel and the revenues went down by 30% and they cannot pay, 
the mortgage. The loan goes into default. And the bank that has that loan goes into default, whereby FDIC as a receiver comes in and says, we're going to take this bank and we're going to turn it over to one of the bigger banks that are well capitalized. At that point, the bigger bank is saying, well, look, these loans are in default. We don't know what we're going to incur. You keep the loans. Instead of FDIC keeping it, they're saying, okay, we'll take these new loans, $4 million loan, and as Nitin said, 80% loss coverage. So you're going to have $3.2 million insurance guarantee that you're not going to lose that much. So as soon as that bank gets an offer on that property for a million dollars, they know they're going to be made whole because they'll go in and turn in the papers and say, we took a $4 million loan, we got a million dollar recovery, we have a $3 million loss and you covered it up to 80%, so if the coverage was 3-2, give me $3 million. FDIC cuts the check, and so the taxpayers and the federal government loses $3 million. The acquiring bank gets rid of that asset as fast as it can because they have no motivation to try to recover $3 million out of that $4 million loan. If they recovered $3 million, there would be a million dollar loss to the taxpayers. But the way the system is structured, there's no incentive to maximize recovery. And by doing that, it's the same thing. The, the borrower loses the hotel rather than giving, getting breathing time, as we said earlier, by some kind of forbearance or some type of uh, arrangement where you get an opportunity to ride out this bad recession for another two, three years. Uh, so the system is made that the faster a bank, if I, was, if I was the acquiring bank and I take all of these assets that are not performing and I have to put reserves on it, the best way to clean up my balance sheet is to get rid of those things fast as possible. Right. And the alternative is very simple. If you just took the same example of $4 million loan, and if you told the guy, so listen, I'll give you for one year or two year interest only payment, or I'll restructure your debt in such a way that you're able to pay the interest. I'll reduce your interest rate. I'll increase your amortization back to 25 years or 30 years. Or if you are at the low end of amortization now, suppose you only have 10 years left. Let me go back to 20 years. Let me take that 6% interest rate, uh, bring it down to four and a half. It's still prime plus one and a quarter, which is a nice rate for a bank. And you restructure that loan and you leave that out for one or two years. The guy would be made whole. After two years, he'll be able to pay principal and interest. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? FDIC didn't have to lose that 80% of $4 million in the loss. So the taxpayer saved the money. The business owner was able to keep the, uh, the hotel. So he did not l lose the employees. Employees did not lose the job. It did not get fenced and closed. All those things are in favor of government. I mean, you are preserving jobs, you're preserving business owners' ability to stay in business, you're not costing taxpayers FDIC money. I mean, it's so simple, sounds so simple, but it's so difficult because bankers are banker and FDIC is bank. They don't understand how the other side could be better for job creation and, and saving the small business. And, and Fred, uh, you know, the result of all this is that you take a, an owner who is doing probably everything humanly possible to keep this business alive, and you take him out of the equation, and you take that property and you either give it to somebody else or it sits vacant. And to Nitin's point, that doesn't help anybody. I mean, the, the rule of the story ought to be that the present owner is the one you, you ought to try to help because they're the ones who have the greatest interest in keeping it afloat. And, and the FDIC needs to mandate to the banks that they operate in good faith in dealing with, with the, uh, the lender, the borrower. The, uh, there are some banks that actually have engaged in a second look process, mm -hmm. and, and that has been successful. Uh, there was one, one bank spokesman that said that, that uh, it's up to about 15% uh, uh, increase from the second look. Rather than foreclosing on the property, they've given it another lifeline. And so, you know, that second look is, is important so that the person in the bank doesn't just say, okay, your numbers don't, don't uh, warrant you to continue, you're gone. Well, escalate it to a supervisor and have another second look. And oftentimes in that particular bank, they were able to save that, that borrower. And Chip, and the reason, another reason that this is so important, FDIC has run out of money two years ago. They don't have the funds to do it. The federal government is in deficit. They can't afford to spend any more millions that are not needed this. Why would not take the other alternative route? Number one. Number two, they increased the bank's deposit insurance fee by three times and took three years in advance. That banks that used my bank's money to pay out these other acquiring banks. 
And now my, my capital is reduced because they charged me three times the premium and took my three years in advance. So I am being now curtailed to lend the money, that money that I could have lent it. For one bank, it doesn't sound that big, but when you multiply by 10,000, eight, 9,000 dollar community banks, I mean, think about the impact on small business lending. So it is absolutely counterproductive to really have the lost share agreement the way they are structured. Now, individually, all lost share agreements are different. A one bank acquiring three different failed banks could have three different loss share agreements. And it's very simple to implement. All they have to do is structure the loss share agreements in such a way that the existing borrower is given enough chance that the foreclosure should be the last route allowed when all other possibilities are exhausted. And, and that really helps the taxpayer, helps the borrower, helps FDIC, helps federal government. I mean, it's a win-win situation. And Neil, as we close out the show, uh, I'd like to end on a positive note, right. and that is the, the SBA, and Fred talked about this in a previous show, there's more capital available out there from the SBA than there has, I think, ever been. Uh, unfortunately, that may be the only source of capital, but that is a bright note, and that is helping hotel owners stay afloat, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And this is going back to you know the last recession, late 80s, early 90s. If we look at historically, all of the transactions were done with SBA loans because lending had dried up. And I mean, you know, if if I had a preference, I'd go to get a conventional loan than SBA loan because there are some you know underwriting criteria and qualification requirements which are tedious. And in some cases, the bigger hotel companies uh, that have multiple assets may not qualify for it because there are I don't I don't even know the it's limits. It's a five million dollar limit. Five million dollar limit. So. You know, we, we went through restructuring uh, six hotel loans totaling $32 million. So I would qualify for one. Right. But one is better than none. Right. Right. Exactly. If, if there was ever a silver lining in this whole lending uh, issue, it is the Small Business Administration. They lent over $17 billion uh, this year. And so, uh, you know, banks rely on that and, and our members and the small business community relies on that. But right. Chip, I must address that the SBA and the USDA, both loan programs were made very attractive last year. The 75% guarantee went to 90% and the 3% fee on a million dollar, you had to pay $30,000 fee was waived. So on a $5 million loan, you're paying $150,000 fee. So SBA loan is very expensive. In this Obama speech, I hope really they address and go back to 2010 because the, the, the lending had quadrupled just because people did not have to pay the fees. As you said, conventional loans are cheaper. SBA should have been the last resort. But because SBA is the only resort available, this we're not asking for free. Like last year, it was completely free, the whole fee was free. But I think if they make 3% fee to 1%, make the guarantee back from you know 75% to 90%, only for temporary period until the conventional uh, lending resumes, then I think you will see more, many, much more capital available in the market. A lot of people who are not been able to refinance the hotels will be able to refinance, keep it, and therefore keep the jobs. Well, we are flat out of time, but gentlemen, this has been uh, very educational, as the show ought to be. And uh, I want to thank you for being with us, Anil Patel, and Nitin Shaw, and of course, Fred Shorts. I'm uh, Chip Rogers, and thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to contact me, it's chip at ahoa.com. That's chip at ahoa.com. Until next week, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.